Talk about it with Fran Jazz. Today's special guest is the owner of YCL Real Estate Consulting Group. Today's guest is Joram Malka. Joram, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Let's start off with a nice little wellness check. How are you doing today? Feeling great, man. Just about to take off to the airport and fly overseas for one month. Doesn't get much better than that. One month. That's exciting. <laughs> Very exciting. The freedom is, is the best part of oh that. Oh, my God. I like it. I Very like nice. it. So let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? I was born on a kibbutz in Israel, the second oldest kibbutz in Israel, 1957. What, what is kibbutz? Kibbutz is a community. Israel had one of the most successful socialistic experiment. It started back in the early 1900s as immigrants were coming to Israel, creating kibbutzim primarily around the perimeters of Palestine, what was actually Israel. But we're not going to get into that too much, you know. And the kibbutzim were charged with creating a buffer zone between us and the Arab countries around us. So I grew up in one of these communities, and we were very close to Jordan and Syria. So in case something happened in the early days, we would be the front line. Wow. So not only would soldiers protect us, we would protect ourselves. Kibbutzim. We grew up in the children's house. We didn't grow up with mom and dad. So we were the children of the kibbutz, wow. not the children of Prosper and Marguerite Malka, my parents who came from Morocco. We were actually the children of the kibbutz. Wow, that's very interesting. Never heard that. Some children called their parents by their first names. Can you imagine that? Wow, I can't. Can't imagine that. Yeah. So is that where you're going back to? That's where I'm going back, and I'm producing a very special event called Virtues. And it's basically YCL World Produ YCL Global Productions uh, event. You've been to one here. Yep. Same company, it's just the Israeli wing, you know, the Asian wing. And it brings together people that live in Israel without looking at their color, culture, religion, Arabs, Jews, Baha'is, Christians, Catholics, everybody. For the first three hours, we're under the sky, and then we go into beautiful shows inside the cultural house of the place where I was born. That's beautiful. That sounds very beautiful. Any fear with what's going on over there? As we don't traveling? fear it at all. We don't fear it at all because we grew up, we were in intermission during school time. We would lay on the ground, everybody, and we would look up and we would see the Israeli aircraft going head to head with the Arabs. We never lost once. We always won. You always would see the MiGs going down to the lake. And wow. the Mirage continuing to the next mission. The Mirage made in France. Israel, su Israel supplied, or was supplied the Mirages. And the Russians supplied the Arabs with the MiGs. It's a fighter plane. We never saw one of our planes coming down. Never. We always won. And we're going to win this time too. So no, we, we have, we Sabres who were born in Israel, no fear at all. Wow. We're like, very, very. That's, a, that's an interesting childhood. Very interesting childhood. So what came after uh, your childhood? What, what were the early teens and 20s like? Did you... Incredible. Um, incredible. Childhood uh, was interesting. You don't grow up with your mom and dad. You don't really get encouragement from every, anybody. You're just expected to be a wild lone wolf, you know? Running with everybody, you know, and you have to figure out a lot of things on your own because it's not encouraged to be emotional. It's not encouraged to be open. Pretty close society. Everybody up each other's butt, you know? So as a child, you didn't always have someone to turn into. So you really needed to figure out how to improvise things to stay afloat. Um, when I became a teenager, I decided to go to school outside of the kibbutz. And that's when my real incredible life began because every time I would come back to the kibbutz every two, three weeks, I was one of the most popular kids because they miss me. <laughs> they miss me. My brother told me, you want to be popular? 
get out of here, come back every two weeks, because I always saw myself as a as a underclass, you know. Yeah. Uh, also, my family was the only Moroccan family on the kibbutz. Everybody came from Europe. Wow. Everybody came from Europe. So we had the black skin, you know, Africans. Yeah. You know, even though I was born in Israel, we were darker than everybody else. Everybody else was blonde with blue eyes, green eyes, and all of a sudden. So that's a bit of a challenge there. But uh, teenage years were incredible. The girls, <laughs> the music, working in the fields, staying up until morning time and then getting on the tractors and going to the fields to work, rolling on the grass with the girls and the boys. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And then three years in the army. Not for me, I'm a pacifist. I don't, I can't even kill a lantern fly, fly much yeah. less. Three years, that's a, a long person. time though, for something a, you don't even want to do. I'm a pacifist now. I don't, I will never be a soldier again. Why did you do it for so long then? Three years, it's mandatory. If oh. you don't go, you consider a loser by default. <laughs> oh my oh, yeah. God. <laughs> if you don't go, you're a complete loser. How do you feel about that mentality? Listen, I did my three years. I didn't shoot at anybody. Nobody shot me. It's behind me. I mean, for, for example, I, for I served to protect my daddy because my daddy protected me and to protect my grandparents. I did my thing. Would I sign an additional day beyond three years? <laughs> no way on earth for all the millions in the world. No way on earth. Not a single minute. A month later, I was here. Six months later, I married Carol. Finished. Wow. And I'm here since 1978. I arrived here December 16th, 1978, June 10th, I married Carol. It's been 47 years that we're together. Congratulations. Yes. That's very nice. Yes. I like that. So when did real estate get into your life? So when I came here, I was forced to work for other people for five and a half years. That's not what I came here for. I can do that in Israel and be just as happy, possibly happier around mom, dad, siblings. But Carol didn't want to take me to real estate school the moment I got off the plane here. She wanted me to orientate, orient myself with American life. So I worked in electronics, I worked in boutiques, I sold shoes, I rented. When TVs and VCRs, the video cassette recorders, first came out, they were very expensive. So there was a company from England that rented that equipment for anywhere from $9.99 a month to $36 a month, depending on the model you got. And that's where I ended my career. Because <laughs> I got my real estate license for free through a company in New York that was selling land in Florida. So I got my license for free, and then one day I was driving on Yonkers Avenue, and I saw a big Century 21 sign. I walked in, and 20 minutes later, I had my own desk, my own phone, I was all of 28, and uh, my first outing as a part-timer, because I was still working Granada TV rental right there on Yankees and uh, Central Avenue. My first outing, my first deal. Monday morning, I go to my boss. He's standing there smoking his cigarette. I said to him, I can't say goodbye, dude. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> Gone. Full-time since then, 39 years. It's going to be 40 years. God bless. 1985, going to be 40. Uh, 2025, going to be 40 years. Wow. And I still like it. It's very strange, but I still like it. That's what matters most. It's the people around me. That's the trick. Mm. From you to your boss to all my other teammates, 40 of them, that's my American family. Because my real American family is tiny. Me, Carol, Yael, Limo, that's it. In Israel, I have 2,000, 3,000 family members. Really? Tons. Wow. Tons. Mm-hmm. That's, that's Here I have just my girls and my wife and my chosen family, which is YCL, 40 of you guys. Wow. That's beautiful. Um, so the first real estate was Century 21 Tree Frog? That's right. Two and a half years. You did research? Of course. <laughs> I worked with Joyce Fortunato for two and a half years, and then I went to Israel for five weeks, and when I came back... Mr. Al Saron made me an offer I couldn't refuse. 
Century 21 in Artsley. And they became like family to me, and I was with them for 22 and a half years. Woo! Did very, very well. And they treated me like I was one of their five children. They were really beautiful, and I stayed. I'm very loyal like that. And another broker from Remax in Eastchester tried to recruit me for 17 years. George Groves, Remax. <laughs> 17 and Post years. And I said, George, I don't care. You can give me a house on top of the hill, a Lamborghini in the driveway. I'm not coming because Mr. Cerrone is like my father. He's my American father. But then Mr. Cerrone died at the age of 93. That's a long life. That's pretty good. And I called George and I said, how about it? <laughs> and then George died at 72 after I was with him for 18 years. and before 18 months, I'm sorry. And right before he died, I asked him, would you give me my, your blessings to open up YCL? He said, wait a minute, before you open up YCL, see this whole office here? I don't know, like 4,000 square feet with all the agents and the secretary and yeah. the computers. I'll sell you my business for 50000 and you can pay me as we go along. I said, what's the rent? He says, 10000 I said, George, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not. 10000 What? No. No. And that's how YCL came about. That's in uh, 2011, right? Precisely 2011 was the grand opening party at the same place where you came to our event, the Scars and Woman Club. Scarlet and I had people coming Scarlet. from as far as Philadelphia. Wow. It was really a kick-ass party. It was amazing. It's a really nice property, too. Very nice property. Oh, we love it. It's been, wow, look how long it's been. Yeah. Is that 23 years? Mm, no, 2011. 2011. To now is actually... 13? 13, 14. 13, I had a 10 Yeah, look. but you know what? We used the Scarsdale Woman Club before we opened up the YCL because YCL has been doing seminars since 1989. Wow. The first time I got my first Oscar in real estate, yeah. it's like when you do $150,000 a year, they give you, looks like an Oscar. I had oh, 14 nice. of those. Wow. The first time I did that in 89, in the late part of 89, I started marketing my knowledge. And I did seminars for everybody. And then I say, why am I running to them? <laughs> Let them come to me. <coughs> Absolutely. Let them come to me. And that's how the, the, the venue here came about. And next year, we're planning on going to audiences from 300 and above. And eventually, it could wind up being audiences of 10,000. Wow. So next year, is going to be a very interesting year for the production arm. Of course, we're in productions, we're in real estate, and we're in property management. We do it all. Wow. Yes. That's incredible. All the things I enjoy. I started like a sandbox. Yeah. There's a sandbox that's for your rum to play in, you know? Love it. That's incredible. When it comes to real estate, what is everything YSL offers? YCL. I'm sorry, sorry I said YSL. YCL is a residential real estate brokerage firm. It sells condominiums, co-ops, land, houses, Sometime we'll get involved in commercial, but we're not really a commercial entity. Our commercial entity is RACO, R-A-K-O-W. I'm sure you've seen their signs. Yeah. Uh, we work with David and with Nico, and all our commercial business goes to them. Um, so we can list your house. We can sell you a house. We can manage your house. It's a one-stop shop. So, for example, if you take the typical real estate deal, you say to yourself, okay, the call comes, the agent gets it. Then the agent bounces it back to the bank for pre-approval. Mm. Once the bank pre-approves it, and we have the proof of fund from the buyers, now we have the green light to start taking the buyer out. Once the accepted offer happens, it goes to the attorneys. We have three of them on the team. Nice. One of them, Andrew Romano. I know you know him. Yeah. Andrew. One of them is Andrew Romano. One, of them, one is uh, Gabriel Marus and Stephen Colon. They're representing all the deals of YCL. Then after that, goes back to the bank for approval of the mortgage, and then comes <coughs> the appraiser that does the value of the house for the bank. After the appraiser, the title company. We have Liliana for that. After the title company comes the insurance, and after the insurance, closing. And then the moving company 
<laughs> yeah. The oil deliveries and gas deliveries. And we have all of these people inside the team. Wow. All the way down to the oil. Cleaning people, contractors, <laughs> surveyors, architects, everything. So I can just go like this, boom, and move aside. They know exactly what they need to do. That's incredible. And that's one way to stay very content and very young and very happy because you're surrounded by amazing people. One-stop shop. It's absolutely a one-stop shop and everybody performs at very high peak, you know? Your company that you work for yeah. is our, there are electricians. Yeah. We never had a problem with them. I put in the job, the next thing it's done. Incredible. PC Richards deliver everything to our landlords and residential clients. So I call Eric Levy. I go, Eric, I need it here. Pop, the next day it's there. So that's why I'm able to like what I steal, what I do. Absolutely. Because it's not hard for me. I'm not alone. And everybody is talented in different areas that I don't necessarily want to know about. Yeah, that's perfect. I really don't want to know about electrician. Yeah. So I have the brothers and you and everybody else working with us, you know. And that's my American chosen family, which is the miracle of it all. Really my family, but only in this family we don't fight. <laughs> I like that. Organic families, we fight all the time. That's beautiful. It is. What is premium knowledge flights? <laughs> that's the event? No. That's yeah, yeah the, the networking event. <laughs> so as a producer, I always love to come up with the wildest names. And this is not <laughs> the wildest one. There was one event that was actually called YCL Foreplay. <laughs> and everybody was telling me, are you crazy? I said, yes, I am crazy. And it's going to be wow. remaining YCL Foreplay. <laughs> and the room was full. So premium knowledge flight was the last event that you came to the flyer was magnificent remember the flyer Absolutely. with the with the concord yeah. <laughs> and we put all the ycl members in a panel and flights were taken off so we took the scars the woman club and we called it terminal one and then every teammate <laughs> was the captain of a different flight and they spoke about entirely different things for a period of, I think, I think 15 minutes. Every flight was about 15 minutes. <laughs> Taking off, coming down, and then you go on another flight. It was a really interesting concept. And from what I heard from people as they were leaving, and even while they were in the room, it was an extraordinary event. It was really, you know, the compliments that we get after these events are sick. People say, how come we felt more comfortable here than we feel around the dining room table with our family? Wow. I said, because the souls of everybody in YCL and also our guests are coming right at you and you're feeling it like a breeze and it's all good. That's why you feel so good. You don't feel threatened, nothing. So premium flights was a series of, I believe, seven flights. <laughs> so from me, you learned this from... Stephen Cologne, you learned that. From the attorney, you learned that. And there were flights that were <laughs> taken off and landing. Taken yeah, off and yeah. 15 minute flights. I like that. It was fascinating. And Jim Weir was the MC, and he is just too much. Jim Weir is incredible. And Jim Weir used to be the appraiser on the team, but he gave up appraisals because the whole appraisal business changed and instead of making so much all of a sudden they were making this little mm. and working harder so he just says hell with it and uh i'm looking for something for him inside ycl because i love the man more than anything in life you know very nice when you're saying um <clears throat> people feel more comfortable at ycl than at the dinner table and you mentioned the breeze it made me think everybody's there for the same reason, the same Precisely. goal, same you know, the same idea. So, the, so the, the breeze is blowing and it's all in the same direction. So From everyone, so. not only from the teammates, what's so fascinating, because the guests are handpicked. You see, it's very interesting. This is not open. Well, it's opening now for the general public. Yeah. 
and I'm not entirely sure that I'm going to be happy with what I see, <laughs> uh, with what I will see, yeah. because now anybody can walk in. Yeah. Uh, it may require us to have selectors or what you call here bouncers. Oh, okay. If somebody comes looking like not presentable, because yeah. notice how beautiful everybody is. Absolutely. The women are gorgeous. The men wear beautiful suits. This is what YCL is trying to put out. So if we're going to open it up to the public, we just may have to um, either hire security or bouncers or selectors or the teammates will be selectors. We don't like you. Make a U-turn. Very easy to get back out and drink and <laughs> go to the next, go to Keller Williams. What yeah. can I tell you? <laughs> this is YCL. Absolutely, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we have standards here. We have high, <laughs> high standards, yeah. Very high. So do you have three current offices? I had 1.4. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to this concept. Let's do it. It was wild. So I got Leslie Vaxima in New Rochelle, who was basically my customer originally. I never met him in seven years. I kept sending him listings. But it, we never really connected. After seven years, I said, it's time to go meet all the customers I never met. And I go to meet him at his New Rochelle Allstate office. And midway into the conversation, he tells me I'm a real estate broker. I says, you're a real estate broker and also an agent and also an uh, insurance person. Why don't we do something? I'll give you all my insurance policies and you'll allow me to put my sign in your window. There goes a YCL office. Wow. I only went there once. That's all it takes. <laughs> once I went there. No, no. After I put my sign, I yeah. only went there once. Why would I come from Riverdale all the way to... But that was a YCL office. It just so happened to have an all-star insurance office on one of the busiest places in the Bronx, White Plains Road. Wow. Right before you go into Mount Vernon. YCL sign. <laughs> That's how you do it. Another office. <laughs> then we had an agent named Matthew who lived in Yonkers. He was a broker. Tuck! <laughs> a sign in front of his house, number three. And then the office in my home, four. And then temporarily, we had an office in Gabriel Marus's office in Manhattan on the sixth or seventh floor. And I would travel by train every Wednesday, only on Wednesday. I would go and work Manhattan real estate. And then I say, what am I doing? <laughs> Who am I trying to impress? I shut down everything and we work from home. But yeah, 1.4 going on 5. <laughs> 1.4. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> where exactly do you work? Westchester, Manhattan, and Bronx only? Or do you venture No, from? no. So... Um, when it comes to listings, we will go up to three hours away from home office listings because wow. listings is gold. Yeah. When it goes with buyers, we have to be very cautious because a lot of buyers don't buy in the first time, second, third, or fourth. And if they take you all the way to Duchess and you have to go up and down every weekend, eventually you'll be working for $1.99 an hour. Yeah. I want the agents to, do, to, do, to come in like a Delta Force. Meet the people, qualify them, pre-approve them, make sure they're ready, willing, and able. Take them out for a total of 15 hours. That's it. Make a deal. Your profit margin is probably 82%. But if you took them out 20 times, yeah. you're working for $1.99. And we explain to buyers now, we're no longer Uber drivers. You have to come. <laughs> yes. You have to come with three fingers on the trigger and prove to us that you're worthy for us to spend time with you. So for listings, there's no limit. We will go anywhere. With buyers, of course, we're very careful. And it's not just Westchester, it's Putnam, Rockland. We will go to Duchess for a listing. We will go to, whew, we'll go, forget about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I like it. Uh, we will go, the Bronx is right now, the Bronx is our largest market share. Very interesting. Yonkers used to be the largest market share. 
It's more populated in the Bronx. Right? I think that's why. Populated is not the word. <laughs> it's not the word. <laughs> that's why mainly, right? It's more populated than Yonkers. And we like it. But in Yonkers doesn't have much going on. Everybody is holding on, not doing anything, waiting for the elections, mm. waiting for this, waiting for that. And what's happening with real estate right now, interest rates are 7 6%. And people are into mortgages that are 2.5%. During COVID, interest rates were two and a half percent. So why would you sell your house at two and a half and buy another house for seven? One hundred percent. I'll wait. Yeah. See what happens, and then I'll see what I want to do. So it creates a very big problem for people who are listing agents like us. We are a listing company, and we sell our own listings. And thank God we have a very, very wonderful rental business, and that's what is floating us right now. And rentals we do in Manhattan as well, because we have George, who does a whole bunch of rentals every year there. But I personally don't go to Manhattan. What do you think is the biggest change within these 39 years of real estate? I know there's a lot of changes, but what's the biggest one? Well, when we started 39 years ago, there was no such a thing, a buyer's agent. Really? All of a sudden, 20 years ago, somebody in the state of New York <laughs> said, there are too many realtors that are not making a penny because they're working with buyers. And guess who controls the market? The listing agents. Yeah? So you want to sell a house, I get the listing. I'm the only one who has a chance to do what's called a double header. List it and sell it. Keep the entire 6 7 5%. Right now, commissions are no longer at 7 Sometimes you can get 6 but you settle for about 5 right? So all these agents were sitting on the sidelines because the buyers got smart and called the listing agent. That's how we did a lot of double headers. If you wanted to work with a buyer, there was no formal paperwork that you signed making you their exclusive agent, just uh, like the seller is your exclusive seller. So you just took them in the car. And they had no loyalty at all. They would work with anybody. Anybody, yeah. So somebody at the state of New York said, let's rearrange things. Let's give buyers an opportunity to sign up with a realtor to be their broker, and they will pay to them the commission. What this buyer's broker did, not only they took from the buyer, they came to us and took what we were offering. And that's why there was a huge loss. Did you hear about the billion point two lawsuit? I did against not. the National Association of Realtors. Wow, no. Keller Williams, Remax, Exit, if I'm not mistaken, a whole bunch of real estate offices because they were double dipping, taken from the buyer and then taken from us. That is the biggest change of the last 20 years. Wow. So what's happening now, we no longer offer a commission on the listing. If you're working for the buyer, you only collect from the buyer. Now, what's happening, a lot of realtors are coming, or a lot of realtors like me, although I haven't had a problem yet because I, I have such a huge base, a lot of my business come from my base, and my sellers are very nice. They will give me the 5%, sometimes they'll give me 6%, but now they're saying, why would I give you 5%? He's collecting from the buyer. I no longer have to pay the buyer, so I'm only going to give you 3%. That is a devastating effect on a lot of realtors that don't have a base. You see, like, if, for example, I, if Kay called me and said, I want to sell my home, right? He's not going to bust my kahunas over. He's probably going to give me 5% because he trusts me. He likes me. But if he doesn't know you, he's going to negotiate you until your chops <laughs> hurt so much. You're going to wind up walking away with 3%. Yeah. So you're making three instead of five. That's hundreds of thousands a year in losses. So we are not yet afraid of it, but what we see is that buyers, brokers are in big troubles. They have been completely sidelined because in some cases, listing brokers are not allowing them to show their listings. Wow. And all of a sudden, we have the right to do that. In the past, if you put it on the MLS, you're obligated to co broker so it's a wild, wild west all over again. <laughs> Anybody can make any decision they want to let you in or not let you in. But we're going to weather that too. And we're going to weather that because we weathered 2008, which was devastating. 
And not only we weathered it, we came out of it with our own company. There you go. So we're prepared to deal with it. I like it. Do you deal with wholesaling at all? We don't. You mean like buying cheap, right? It's oh. more like a contract where you're just like middlemaning the deal. You assign, for days, you assign like it like the contracts? No, we don't deal. We, we don't do... Um, we are not... <laughs> this may be controversial. Get ready. We are not ocean bottom feeders. We leave that to the shrimps and all the other. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very muddy. Yeah. Very, ew. everybody is greedy in that segment of the market. <clears throat> Foreclosures, um, uh, off-market properties that are not being brought to the attention of everybody on the market. They're hush-hush behind everybody's back. We don't do anything immoral, nothing unethical. We don't lie, so we don't, have, we don't need to have very good memory. Because we don't lie. <laughs> there you go. Um, we are probably one of the few companies that do real estate based on the Ten Commandments. To the T. We are moral capitalists. I like it. We do not like capitalism. Mm -mm. Moral capitalism, yes. Capitalism, mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I like it. What about your kids? Do you do you want them to follow your footsteps, or you want them to just? To that be was happy? my dream. <laughs> That's always the dream, right? That all the YCLs will be all the L. Carol Limo will all take over the business. Limo became an amazing uh, musical theater actress. Graduated from NYU. Tish. <clears throat> She's a singer. She's a writer. She's an actress. She's incredible. She's very funny. She didn't study comedy, but she's a comedian. <laughs> she does poems like you do. Uh, Limo lived in three continents so far. Wow. She lived in Asia, Europe, US. She speaks three languages. Both my kids and my wife have dual citizenships, America, Israel. Uh, and Yael is an international photographer. Um, they're both self-employed, which is what daddy asked them to please do and to try not to work for anybody. So daddy is very happy about that. And Carol is retired, but she worked with me for almost 32 years. Very nice. I have no plans on retiring ever. This is way too much fun. Yeah, what are you going to do? Sit on a beach, you know? That gets boring very fast. Play <laughs> golf with all these guys who... I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I respect that 100%. You know. <clears throat> a lot of people think they want to sit on a beach, but they really don't. It gets boring. No, retirement, um, I learned that from my father. People like us retire, we're dead an hour later. No, you have to move and shake until my father is 94. I'm going to see him in two days. He's my co-producer at the event in Israel. 800 people in the audience. Wow. He's going to stand next to me the entire event. He's going to take a really long nap in the afternoon <laughs> so he can withstand. <laughs> That's incredible. That's beautiful. My father is magnificent. Magnificent. Uh, Very nice. What do you think the fine line is between teaching your kids right from wrong, <clears throat> expecting them to listen, so they don't make mistakes, the ones that you know better. And on the opposite side is letting them make mistakes because hiding them and protecting them from everything makes them kind of weak. There's a fine line between there. How do you feel about that from a, you know, a parent's point of view? It's very, very interesting. Let me try to gather my thoughts on that. I believe that People who suffer are better for it. That means that if you run into a lot of walls in your life, it may at the moment feel like it's really very painful. But pain and suffering teaches you things that spoiled people will never learn. <laughs> and it also allows you, you become very strong. And you gather a lot of experience with how to deal with, with adversity. Saying that, and it's all good, we treated our children very, very nice. Uh, we shielded them. I will not 
tell you otherwise. We shielded them. We supported them. Uh, they had a very good life. But looking at things today, we see that both Yale and Limo are very strong, but incredibly opinionated. You know, they saw mommy and daddy hundreds of times fighting, making up, fighting, making up. That's a very important lesson. They knew from the get-go, mommy and daddy will never break apart. Never. Never. And today we know we are going to go to the end of the line. No matter how many times we disagree and how many times maybe we scream it a little, sometimes we curse a little. She's my best friend. I love her today more than I loved her at 19. And they have seen all of this. Now, despite the fact that it appears like they didn't listen, if you say it good enough, it's going right into their chromosomes. And they will act out on what they saw from you as they grow older. And that is fascinating. Uh, but we didn't want them to suffer. We're not the kind of parents that say, let's throw them into the pool and see how they don't drown now. <laughs> no, we don't do that. No, we didn't take a risk with our children. Physical risks? Never. Always there, always making sure, you know. I think that's what it is. It's <clears throat> teaching them right. Also, they're watching you. They're watching everything you do. So if you're doing right, teaching them right, eventually they will go into the real world. And you said another great word, support them. Support them. Only make sure that money is not even on the table. You got to love what you do. And if you love what you do, it's more valuable than any amount of money. And that's how we brought them up. That's and true. they saw how hard we worked. And they were the recipients of it. The vacations overseas and after school programs and riding horses and doing gym cats and... You know, that's a lot of money. A lot of money. Yeah. And they're the recipients. And now that we're looking at them, they are world ready. But they also know how to pick their friends. And they also know how to pick the right thing to do and where to travel. They're researchers, you know. Mm. And that saves them a lot of heartache. They research, research, research. Very smart kids. Much, much, much smarter than Carol and I. No comparison at all. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Sounds like you did and a that's great what job. we want. Yeah, definitely. Where you know parents want their kids to be safe and okay. You know, the day we're not going to be here to protect them, we want them to have a level-headed, uh, good, straight, positive life mindset. Steve Jobs said, "The most important thing you should teach your kids is how to be happy, mm. not how to make money, not how to run a business. Is how to be happy." Content is even better. I like that. Because contentment, the contentment lives right below the belly button and all the way here. If you can keep the lake placid, the sky can fall down on you and you'll smile like an idiot. You're totally content. What does the stomach part mean? What do you mean? Hmm? What the, the belly button part, what is that? What do you mean by this that? This is the lake. That's the lake here. What do you mean? <laughs> your soul, your heart. The lake. Oh, I never heard uh, it be called a lake. I'm very spiritual. Yeah. So some of the things I say, some people never heard because I didn't learn spirituality from books. Mm. I taught myself based on guidelines that I'm giving to myself. So this is the lake below the belly button all the way to under the chest. And if you can keep the, it's the core. If you can keep it very calm, and if you can connect your soul with your mind and do it properly with the right wiring and it's nice and strong, you will not worry ever in your life. Never. You will never worry. So when you don't worry, what seeps in? Contentment. Mm. Contentment comes from here. And if this is connected to this, it maintains the contentment. And no matter what happens around you, you're always smiling to everybody. You always say hello. You always, you don't gossip about people. You don't wish anybody harm. And that's really the way to live. So you basically, with this, you're neutralizing the ego, which is the world's biggest destroyer, the ego. <laughs> I talk about the ego a lot on this podcast. You want to control the ego. You don't want it controlling you because we all have it. But when it controls you, then the sphere seeps in. Being conceited sips in. Being f 
mm, jealous, mm. the worst of the worst of all emotions. Yep. You become a Lucifer. You become one of Satan's messengers. Not a good place to be. And while we're asleep, he's wide awake, recruiting his ass off. And we need to confront these people and tell them, hey, Lucifer, we know you're here. Take 18 feet back. This is what the world is coming to, my friend. I've been studying this a lot lately. Right now I'm reading his book called uh, The Power of the Now. And it mentions the ego a lot because living in the now, the present, there is no ego. The <laughs> ego lives in the future and in the past. That's right. But if you're living right now, you're doing very good at breaking away from that ego controlling you. It's very brilliant, yeah. Yeah, so I'm very big on that. And I taught myself over the last 35 years how to, how to fall in love with myself, not from a centric point of view, but to accept all the defects and to embrace all the perfections. Mm. They come together. It's Absolutely. just like bad and good will forever live side by side so we can choose. And hopefully more of us are choosing good over bad. The same thing. Nobody's perfect. We don't, I don't want to be perfect. <laughs> it's awful. It'll be boring to be perfect. <laughs> it's awful. Yeah. Uh, I want to have flaws. I want to have things that I'm, you know, I used to dwell on, oh, I was such a bad student. I didn't pick up any math. So what if I didn't pick up math? I picked up other things. I played soccer. I played ping pong. It's much more fun than math. <laughs> so there's no need to dwell on it so much. But you got to think, you know, you taught yourself English over the last 40 years. You know your Hebrew really good. You have a great family. You have, you know, so no need to be so hung up on school. Because unless you're completely dumb, nobody would ever know that you're stupid. <laughs> I like that. And I'm not like the that. sharpest tool in the shed when it comes to scholastics. <laughs> yeah. But you would never know it because I love language. And I come across like maybe I'm not as stupid. <laughs> but ask me, ask me nine plus nine. That's I'm going to have to think nine. for a second. <laughs> but nobody will ever know unless I tell them. Yeah. So I'm not smart. Maybe I'm street smart, you know? Yeah. But I'm not school smart. So what? Yeah, that's okay. So what? <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's only one smart out of all the, all the smarts. Street, uh, book smart. It's, yeah. not, it's not that important also. Yeah. Who's the first person you think of when you think of success? So I measure success entirely different than everybody else. <laughs> Monetary success is nothing to me. Me. What I was and what I've become um, has nothing to do with money. I've always had it. I've been poor. I've been the working poor. And I've been upper middle class. So I've visited everywhere. It's wonderful. Um... Success is, first of all, how you see yourself and how it manifests in your daily communications with others. It begins first with how you see yourself and then it goes right to, do you respect mom and dad? That is major. Do you respect your children, your siblings? So we are lucky enough to have it packaged beautifully. We have a very strong family. The brothers, the sisters, everybody, you know. So that's, the first measure of success. Now, once you have that, how quickly can you get to a position where you are no longer the center of uni universe and you become a light? You shine a light on all the people you come across. Mm. That's major. And once you do that, you basically, of course, we can get into all the ins and outs, but basically once you're at step six or seven in the, on the evolutionary Ladder, you are basically flying above it all. That's spirituality. Uh, you're no longer from here, if you will. You are from somewhere else. You're an external, you know? Uh, and that's something I wish every person, but it takes decades. If you do it with books and you adhere to what the books say, you can be done in less than five years. 
I didn't do it with books. <laughs> it took me three decades, okay? I didn't do it with books, and I'm not sorry that I didn't do it with books because I learned so much along the way by running into different issues, whether it's teenage children that are very difficult to handle. You know, being married is the most difficult thing we do. Raising children is number two. I agree. It's true. You know why marriage is difficult? Because we think we're going to fit one another. We totally missed the point. We're not supposed to fit one another. We're supposed to complete one another. Mm. We will never fit one another. And I'll say right on here, women are the upgraded version of humanity. We never going to be like them. We're never going to be as pretty as them. We're never going to be able to multitask like they do. We will never have patience for the children like they do. They are just a better version of what we are. And if we can understand it very early on, then maybe marriage won't be so difficult because when they tell us, why didn't you move this from here to there? You know why they do that? They want us to be better. But we don't think about it. We got to get into an ego thing. Why didn't you wipe the top of the table? They want us to be better. You know, so I am a big feminist. Um, and I think the revolution is here. And I think we need to give them an opportunity to run the world. That's deep. Because we did not do very well. Male did not do very well. I think women would do much better. <clears throat> very interesting point of view. Never heard that before. How do you feel about Harris running? You think she's good for the fir first female president? So I'm not a very political person, but I will make my opinion here. And I will try not to hurt anybody. Uh, I told Carol a few weeks ago, she's going to prosecute Trump on the world stage. And she is doing it already. <laughs> she is killing him. She is ripping him apart. And to me, she is a hero. Mm. To me, she is a hero. Uh, I always wanted a president that was not white. We've had enough of those. We see where we are today. Um, I always wanted something that is not only really great from the aspect of having IQ, but even more importantly, EQ, emotional uh, intelligence. And she has the whole package. I'm not going to say anything derogatory about Trump. I wish him to 120, but I also hope he'd leave us alone once and for all. <laughs> leave us alone. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I get it. <clears throat> It's interesting. We're living through history right now. You too know? much mayhem. You know, <laughs> it is. <laughs> too much. There has been too much. Too much. The last few years have been intense. Yeah. It's no good. It's, it's no good. good because, you know, most people are not like me and you. Most people are part of a herd. Mm. And where the herd is going is where they're going. Yeah. And these herds are the most dangerous things on the face of the earth. I agree. I wish more people would take an independent route and make a difference in the world, you know? That's what I think. And Kamala is, I like her. I like her. Good. She's pretty. She's smart. She has, wow, she's gutsy. But she knows how to keep her ego under control. I love that. Good. So she's a mirror image of Trump. <laughs> upside down you know <laughs> interesting it is interesting it's very interesting it's and she's like ah. the next two months will be very interesting <laughs> and the elections are on my daughter's birthday limo was born november 5th <laughs> oh man and i don't have to tell you what limo thinks uh -huh. you saw them at the last event i'm not sure i think so I'm not sure if we met, but I, I didn't. I they saw stand you with, with their mom and walked out for a moment. I think so. Yeah. And Jim says, "And this is the Y, the C, and the L." Remember? Yeah, yeah, I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> they are too much, these girls. So bringing up children, when you tell them the moment they're born, you hold them up and you say, "Oh my God, 
you are the sunshine of my life and then you pump into them you're beautiful you're this you're this then it turns on you like they behave like they are the best thing in the world yeah this is what you wanted them to be but now they're practicing anew and that's tough yeah what was, was that the teen years uh the change started the most started when she was nine she's still doing it now <laughs> she's gonna see it she's killing me <laughs> it's killing me but limor is limor is like my twin only take me and multiply 200 times it's limor what an amazing human being <laughs> i gotta cover over what i just said <laughs> oh, i'm dead yeah right <laughs> i'm dead <laughs> oh man as a kid what did you want to be when you grew up it's interesting i wanted to grow up you know when you're a kid you yeah. want to be an adult you want to be an adult i remember that coming across my mind so many times a, a specific profession wasn't so the i grew up in a oh my god it's painful I grew up in a society that had no individual aspirations. Wow. Because everybody shared everything. My daddy wanted to take a car. He would have to go to the person that is in charge of the seven or eight car fleet, write his name. He'd get the keys, take the car, bring it back. Somebody else would, he had no car. You had no mobility. It, if you wanted to do a trip in the field, you'd take a tractor and then bring it back. Wow. But you had no TVs. One TV in the cultural house and everybody watches that TV. 400 people eating at two shifts, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Basically, look at a beautifully cut grass. The moment one strain of grass went above everything else, they cut you down. Everything has to be equal. So nobody achieved anything. They all achieved together. Wow. And this is how he grew up. So he said to himself, what's my aspiration? My aspiration is to be part of the cut grass. Like, <laughs> flat. Wow. That's why I left. Because I'm an individual. I want to eat the world, you know? There you're limited. Limited? Oh, and if you just try to grow above everybody, whoop, they cut you right down. Wow. So no aspiration as a child. Was it easy to leave? It sounds like it won't be easy to leave a place like that. Well, I left because I'm an individual, and yeah. that place celebrates... Fitting in. <laughs> everybody fitting in. Well, how but I, I mean physically how am I leaving, fit was it easy? Fitting in for me, no. No, leaving, physically leaving. For me, yes, mom cried her heart out. Of course. Yeah. Well, I had... My back was watched here from day one, Carol had a beautiful apartment for us the moment I arrived. Put me in one of the best neighborhoods in New York City, Riverdale. Oh, yeah. So I fell into shit right off the bat. I didn't really suffer here for one second. It was a nice cushion. I never suffered here. Never. Never. Um, and it's wonderful. So it was very easy for me to live. In fact, I was uh, to leave, to leave Israel. To leave the kibbutz. Yeah. I knew I had no interest. I don't blame you. No interest at all. No interest in the kibbutz. I did want to stay in Israel. I'm sorry. No problem. My calendar is telling me to call Fisbos <laughs> for sale by owner. A second. Let me kill the phone altogether. Um, to leave Israel, I absolutely didn't think I would because I love my country. But back when we started, inflation was 400% wow. in Israel. It was devastating. So we said, we're going to start in New York. And here we are. Beautiful story. What are three things you need to be happy? I believe I touched on it. Number one, know who you are. Accept yourself with all your faults and all your perfections. And then don't keep it to yourself export it out to the world do at least three good deeds a day mm. minimum i don't care even if you did it for a bird that is limping and you picked it up and you maybe made sure it's safe and maybe put some cream on it and put a little could be a bird could be a lantern fly don't go around killing them see how everybody's killing lantern flies 
I'll put them right here and go, <laughs> don't kill them. The city is telling everybody to kill them because they eat up the trees. Well, let the city do it. They have enough <laughs> sanitation. Why are you making the people kill them? This is nature. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't kill them. You saw a bug in your kitchen? Slap the floor really hard so your wife thinks that you killed it. And then pick it up with the tissue. Grab it from the whiskers and put it outside the window. You will be so pleased with yourself, you know? Be respectful as you can. As respectful as you can to your kids, to your elder. Your wife should be put on a pedestal. You know, the year that she helped me in real estate, plus she did the kids. The kids is the hardest work on earth. She didn't get a penny. <laughs> Not a penny. They should really make money. Mothers should make money. I really think so. It's the hardest job in the world, what they have to be put through. Respect the mom and dad, and then you don't have a single obligation against your soul. See, the thing with obligations against your soul, every time you gossip, every time you curse, every time you treat somebody bad, you don't understand, but it goes right into your soul, and that's why people get sick in the kidneys. The kidney is connected to your soul. People with kidney disease, people with other diseases, it's because there's so much block in their soul, they get sick. Don't ever allow that to happen. Just be a good person. What's so difficult about it? It's much more difficult to be a lousy person. Why would anybody want to be a lousy person? I really don't understand what's going on. Some people do it all day, every day. Every day, because day. Satan is recruiting them, left and right. Nice. If they control their egos, Satan won't, won't be able to touch them. But how many people you met today that control their egos? How many? Tell me. Sadly, very few. It's a problem. I don't even know if it's 1%. It's a problem. It is a problem. So we're working on meeting the best people, and together with meeting the best people, we do the events here, we do the events in Israel. You know, the event in Israel, the, one of the most beautiful things about it is that Arabs are going to do the security at the event. Oh, nice. So Arabs are going to be securing Jews, Christians, Baha'is, Hindus. I just am asking everybody to pray that nobody is going to start shelling the Jordan Valley on the 7th because then I have to postpone the event because the event is near the Jordan River. If they start, if they start shooting on the 7th, boom, postponed it. Let's hope for the best. We're trying to do our part. And this is how it, uh, and this is how you make yourself very happy unconditionally, no matter what happened. It, happiness is fleeting, by the way. It's the contentment I'm talking about, because that lives inside you. Nobody can take it. Happiness is not the best thing in the world. People make the biggest mistake while happy. People make the because happy is like adrenaline flooding your brain. Worst decision. Content. I like it. Contentment is much more balanced. You almost don't make mistakes and you analyze everything and you analyze risk and you analyze why should I go to this person and not go to that person. Contentment gives you a very wonderful bird's eye view on everything. You're here, but you're looking at it from there because if it's tied up to spirituality, you're not really from here. How many spiritual people do you know that really follow the guidelines of spirituality? I know many spiritual people that talk, pa, 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 <laughs> and then I look at their life, and they're a mess. Yeah. <clears throat> no, spirituality is clear-cut. Ten commandments. Don't ever hurt anything. And minimize yourself. Who do you think you are? <laughs> You're a speck of dust traveling through the Tunnel of time. You're nothing. A blip. A blip. You are nothing. Behave <laughs> like you understand that you are nothing. Yeah. And people would pay much more attention to you. Live by example. Lead by example. Lead by example. It's phenomenal what happens. I agree wholeheartedly. 
A hundred percent. Do you have any idea of what the afterlife is? Afterlife? I think I'm going to turn into a horse. I want to turn into a horse in the afterlife. Um, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to ever ride me. <laughs> I want to be... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No saddle, just a free horse. Just a free, running free with the hair flying all over like a stallion. Um, I really feel it could happen. I hope I answered the question properly. Yeah, of course. It's it's your opinion. At the end of the day, we don't know for a fact. We don't know. That yeah, was just. I just wanted to know what you, what you thought it was. You know. And I don't think I'm gonna meet my mom there because my mom is here all the time. Mm. So, I'm not expecting her there because she never went. She's here all the time. And she really, I mean, mom transitioned the age of 86 about five or six years ago. And those were the biggest years of growth for me because she's sitting here and she's like navigating me. It's fantastic. That's beautiful. It's fantastic. And dad is still here to watch me real time. But you have to be ready to think like that. Absolutely. You can't just think like that out of nowhere. And because we take so much for granted. So much for granted. Yeah, you have to not just think it, you have to really believe it and you live it. You have to believe it. Right? Like, for example, Limo told me today that when she goes to Israel in January, she always goes to grandma's mm. grave. And I said, I don't go to grandma's wave because she's right here. And it was interesting. A grandchild yeah. versus a son. And uh, you have to think about it. Why is it like that? Uh, because you're spiritual. Right. I don't need to be there. First of all, what's there right now is nothing. It's a it's whole bunch her. of maggots. Yeah, it's not her. It's not cool. It's not cool. I remember my mom. Wow. A saint. A saint. So yeah, I understand it's very close to the water, and the water, you can hear the water, and you can see at the Galilee Lake, you know, because mm. we live in a very, very, very beautiful place. Uh, but why would I go there for nothing? I'm when, dealing when with the soul with now. Yeah, she's with you. But I can understand. Limo likes to take the little rock and put it on top of, you know, the Jewish people put the rock on yep. the thing. And she likes to read to her in French. Because she speaks French, she speaks Hebrew, she speaks English. Because my mother is from Morocco, by default she speaks mm. French, you know. They speak French and they speak Arabic. Okay. And, um, but the ale doesn't go, the little one doesn't yeah. go. So, uh, Limo is very spiritual, I think, in, a, in her own way. It's not quite my way, it's in her own way. She'll never be like me, because she didn't have my childhood, she mm -hmm. didn't. Her childhood was, mm, I wish it on all of us. <laughs> Let's put it this way. <laughs> Absolutely. Carol always say, I wish I could be reborn as Limo. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. Incredible. It's interesting. Where can the people find YCL? Is there a social media or is it just phone number, email? YCLrealestate.com. We are also on Facebook. We are on Instagram. Shade runs our entire social media. Not me. I don't enjoy it. Shade does everything. And uh, we are going to have major, major social media presence starting immediately because Shade is on it. Um, we never had it before because I'm just, I don't like it. I'm also the type of person that makes about a thousand phone calls a month. And I will always swill, because that's why I'm still here. <laughs> My base is forever being watered, and the sun is on it, and I am it. I make the phone calls. And uh, a lot of the people on my base are my friends. You're becoming my good friend, you know. Uh, and I believe in face-to-face -face and in real contact. And I said in a seminar about 11 years ago, I think the first seminar after we did, after we became YCL in 2011, I said to everybody, if you think that the internet is going to keep you in business, I suggest you think long again. And we see now people that have no base are out of business. 
people that have no base we have 23,000 people in the base that will I can never finish calling all of them <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing <laughs> that is and wonderful. that's why we're still here and the nice thing about YCL that the same base serves for both businesses real estate and property management and most of the people that come to the YCL events at Sixth the Women Club are from the base so the base encompasses three businesses and guess what I just discovered in the last few days what's that it also covers the Israeli event because some people on my teammate, I told them, I sent a letter and then I spoke to everybody in person and I said, if you feel the need to support the state of Israel through what it's going through and you feel it really deep with tremendous amount of conviction, feel free to send to me by Zell any amount of money you want and allocate the money to where you want it to go. Do you want it to go to a child from the city next door to where we have in the event and comes from a very poor family? Maybe you'll say, Yoram, buy him the seat for $77. $77, uh, right. Mm. It's a 200 shekels. Mm. You know, and then the kid, the teenager, will have a seat. He hasn't been to a show since he was born. You want to give it to somebody who survived the Holocaust. They're all in their 80s and 90s now. Before they die, do you want to dedicate it to somebody who survived the Holocaust? Do you want to give it to a soldier that just came from Gaza, who just came from Lebanon, and so his friends get killed? Who do you want to give it to? Do you want to give it to one of the older people in my community who built the kibbutz? We have my father at 94, ah. my caretaker at 96, my teacher at 101. Do you want to pay for their seats? Wow. And people on my team are sending me money. So the base here serves the event there. And I don't know how much luckier than that you can get. That's a strong base. But you must feel absolutely connected to that. Don't give a penny unless you feel that, first of all, you trust me. Mm. Second of all, that I will do with every penny exactly what nothing goes for administration, nothing... And it's very touching how they give. Teammates, customers, and I am not even done with 7% of them. I have another 93% I can call. It's a big base. And almost everyone gives. I don't dictate the amount. I don't. Oh, and there's a great, there's a, it's called purifying the money. <laughs> so if you give it to me, when I see the Zell, I'll close my eyes. I will forward it to Carol. Carol will take the money from the bank, put it in an envelope with your name, your email address, your phone number, seal the envelope, and only one person is allowed to count it on October 5th. My daddy. Wow. 93, going to be 94 years old. And then it's going to say, Francisco, da 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 Please give it to a lady soldier, not to a boy soldier. Give it to a beautiful lady soldier. And I would think, who do I call now? Let me see. Maybe I'll look at Facebook and I'll see this beautiful soldier with an M16. <laughs> say, Here's the girl. I'll call her and say, Francisco gave you a ticket for October 10. Like that. But I would never see the money. I would never count the money. I would never touch the money. Mm. Only my daddy is allowed to do it. It's, we call it purifying the money. And we do the same thing at events here. You mm. bring an envelope, I don't even bother with it. Carol counts it on Sunday or Monday, and then I'm not the money person. Yeah. I'm just a producer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, like and we want our guests to know that this is how we treat money. We treat it with, I don't know what to tell you. What is it to you? It's a tool. It's a tool. That's all it that's is. That's it. That's it. No emotion, no feeling. It's a tool. It's just people focus so much on it because it's such a necessity. And it feeds your ego. It feeds your lifestyle that you think you need and want. So people think of it as something bigger than just a tool. But at the end of the day, it's just a tool. You can't dedicate your life to it Absolutely because you've got to be out of your mind to do it. You would miss so many points along the way if you do that. Absolutely. And if you're talented enough, it will come like a river that never... How do you explain that a person that didn't even finish, what, 
uh, let me see. I did eight, eight grades and then two in high school. By the time I was 16, out. How come I'm okay? <laughs> How come I'm okay? Right? <clears throat> Absolutely. So what's the big deal? How many... Uh, <laughs> listen. Real estate is incredible. Because if you can make decent money, you have more freedom than a multi-billionaire. There you go. And you're 10 times more relaxed. Because you don't have... Looking to see how much my money grew today, you are much more relaxed. You are much more content. It's fascinating how it works, but you gotta make enough, especially if you live in New York. In New York today, a family of four needs one hundred eighty thousand just to break even. How many people do you know that make one hundred eighty? Not many. Maybe one percent. <laughs> it cost us when the girls were coming up a minimum of one forty nine a year. But then comes the vacations, and before you know it, it's approaching 182000 And then comes college. So what happens if you don't make 182000 What, are you going to live on the street? <laughs> right? Interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting. Very, Not, very times interesting. Are, times are high. Ooh, this is the, the most expensive place in the world. Yep. Yeah, New York to, is it. New York City, specifically. You have to be very, very smart. My wife and I were walking on the street the other day in uh, the village. This restaurant, 160 for a plate, 180 for a plate. And I'm looking at Carol, I'm saying, what do I need that? You make better food than they do. Let's go home. The hell are they serving? And we ended up <laughs> at a, an amazing burger place, and both of us ate for 106 bucks, including the tip. There you go. Why would I give somebody 160? What, what am I trying to prove? And even though Steven Van Zandt was sitting there, you know Steven Van Zandt? No. You know the East Street Band, Bruce Springsteen? Oh, yeah. He's the guitar player. Wow, there you go. He was eating a plate $160. <laughs> I said, I don't care if Elvis sits here. They're wow. not getting 160 from me. That's intense. So you have to... Been there, done that. Took the limousine, took Carol to Paris, got the limousine. The girl stayed with the babysitter. Nice. Wasn't impressed with the limousine. The limousine, 150 down. What does it really prove? How is it riding better than my beautiful 19-year-old Dodge Caravan? <laughs> <laughs> Being driven is nice. But the size of a limousine, if it's not full of people, if every seat is not taken, it's a waste. <laughs> But being driven is nice. That's, that, <sighs> I'd say that. It's okay. Better than driving, I'd say. You know. Eh. I like it. I like being driven. I've been driving since before I even had a, a learner's permit. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's nice to actually be driven when I'm driven around. It's nice, it's yeah. Nice. That, that's the only part, I'd say. <clears throat> but does it make you happier or does it just give you pleasure for the moment? Pleasure for the moment. That's exactly what we're missing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the moment, I'm like, I don't have to drive. I, I don't wanted, have to deal with traffic. I want it to last. <laughs> How can I make it last? Yeah. That's what it's about. That's what it's about, to make it last. So <clears throat> the less immediate gratification we get <clears throat> and the more long-lasting gratification we get, you have to choose. Do you want the immediate graphic? That's what most of the West want. Absolutely. Right now? Right now. Right now. But we got to try long-term gratification and see what happens and compare the two. Long-term wins every time. <laughs> long-term wins every time. You know, it's very easy to be rich for somebody who's a thief. But when you're a moral capitalist, becoming rich takes seven times longer. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> what are you gonna do you gotta, you gotta you're paying taxes while. you're doing everything right there's no way it's gonna accumulate so quickly absolutely because the government takes between 18 and 33 percent depending on your tax bracket right yeah the rest of it um uh, education our kids today to finish college 150 200 thousand wow if you pay for it, what do you think just happened here? I don't think we should pay for our children. I think they should earn it by themselves. Yeah. I don't think we should pay for them. Yeah, start them off strong. <laughs> we already paid 
280,000 from the moment they were born until they went to college. It's almost 300,000. Wow. Today, it's more. Absolutely. It was almost 300 when my kids were. <laughs> yeah. Now I can't even imagine. Can't even imagine. You understand? <clears throat> so you got to make a lot of money here because quite a bit of it goes to the government. So what is it? Taxes and then all the passive taxing. Taxing. The, the ta taxing, I'm sorry. The, 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 the meters. Oh, yeah. The tickets. The tolls. Uh, Everything. Much. Sales tax. Sales tax. <laughs> right. <laughs> Capital gains. It never ends. It never ends. So I'm telling you straight out that 80% of all the people who have the more than a million bucks did not make it fair and square. I'm sorry. They did something. Something. <laughs> Absol absolutely something. <laughs> Otherwise, Somewhere if, they cut a corner. They cut a corner. They deceived. They manipulated. They coerced. I'm telling you, I've seen it. Makes sense. I agree. It will never accumulate so quickly unless you put it on steroids. And how do you put it on steroids? You know that people kill people for money? Absolutely. <laughs> I rest my case. Absolutely. So I highly recommend moral capitalism. <laughs> there you go, moral <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> We're nearing the end of the podcast. If you could let the people know any last advice or anything you have coming up that they should tune into. Well, December 20th, YCL's foreplay, the holiday party at the Scarsdale Woman Club. You got to experience it to understand that it has been conceived by a human being. I cannot tell you what it feels like. You have to be there. 77 bucks a ticket. You want to give us your sponsorship? $500 per business. The food? Here, ask my friend, how is the food? Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two live acts plus a singer. Um, amazing people, probably. I will not exaggerate if I will say people from at least 32 countries will be there, speaking some of maybe <laughs> minimum 26 languages, but you know in some countries you have multiple dialogues, especially in Africa, uh, dialects, especially in Africa, somebody can speak like <laughs> four languages, depending on what part of Africa. Uh, and it's a rainbow coalition, if you will. Um, Everybody comes. And what they have in common, everybody is nice. It's sort of like a night in heaven. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Good Safe one. travels. Yeah, it was a great, great conversation. <laughs> Me and they learned a lot about real estate, about YCL, a lot about love. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Please subscribe, and peace and love. There you go. Only love. Mm-mm. <laughs>